Uh, introduction of late items, I know that, uh, and if you're okay with me being informal in terms of addressing people by first name, staff, I'll do Mr. and Mrs., but if it's okay. Uh, Jerry has a request for an addition, I believe. Yes, uh, I would like to add the LED project on Bowen Road. We moved it downtown. That's the correct place. Uh, Ms. Nelver, where would we place that? I can go under 7B, other business. 7B, thank you. Anything else for the late item? There being a motion to adopt the agenda as amended. Moved by Cheryl, seconded by Diane. In favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Um, adoption of the minutes of the meeting held on December the 14th, 2017 at 9 a.m. and on January 10th, 2018 at 9 a.m. We can do them together. So moved. Moved by Cheryl, seconded by Diane. Any other submissions? In favor? Carried. Uh, presentations, um, Mr. Member, number A is Maurice Primo, uh, Acting Deputy Assessor Assessment. I, yeah, thank you very much. I uh, did provide an update regarding the 2018 property assessments. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, you have as long as you need. It's uh, it's not a very big presentation, but uh, it shouldn't take too, too long. So first off, I'd like to introduce myself as uh, an introduce. I'm Josh Primo, I'm the Acting Deputy Assessor for the Central Bank of Rhode Island Regional Assessment. <coughs> Excuse me. I was invited by Diane and his coffee to attend today to just give a very high level overview of the assessments in the in the Nile area in the Central Bank of Rhode Island region. Um, is Trish here? No, they're communicating with Trish. Okay. So um, who has control? So just on the board behind you. So today we're going to talk about, we're going to give a high level of BC assessment, valuation principles, classification, assessment cycle and key dates, uh, relationship between assessments and taxation, and their 2018 assessment rule. So BC assessment was established in 1974 under the Assessment Authority Act in response to ready for fair and independent organization that value of all property types of British Columbia. Prior to that, every municipality and region and local government did their own and it was chaos. So we were formed under the Act in 1974. And as you probably already know, we are a provincial bound corporation independent of all taxing authorities. Um, the annual list of uh, uh, assessment rules and annual list of property values that provide state and predictable rates for property taxation in British Columbia. Um, identifies ownership, value, classification, and exemptions for each property type. Um, every it represents over two million properties with a total value of about 1.86 trillion dollars collectively in the province of British Columbia. It provides a stabilized base for local governments for taxing and raises about seven and a half billion dollars in revenues each year. So when I say a stabilized base, we usually see typically less than a two percent appeal rate on our on our property assessments. We've had some recent changes at BC Assessment that I'll go over here. We have a new president and CEO, Jason Grant. He just started, uh, he took over January 1st from David Highfield, who was in an active role from Archer Cotty Fair, who was our previous CEO. Uh, Jason's been with BC Assessment since 1991 and served as the assessor for the Vancouver office from 2004. Okay. Uh, we also have a new VP of assessment, Mike Bates. And um, if you're not aware, the Bank of Brown Green was split into three zones Victoria, Nanaimo, and Courtney for their corporate head office in Ontario, near Victoria. The Vancouver of Brown assessment uh, management team is led by Tina Ireland out of Victoria office. <coughs> Deputy Assessor Jerry Marola in Victoria, he's responsible for all ICNI properties on Vancouver Island. Uh, Cynthia Wright is also in Victoria. She's responsible for all residential class properties in British um, on Vancouver Island. And then there's myself, uh, responsible for um, all the cost properties, um, which are airports, sawmills, um, other legislative property types of farms. Um, I'm also responsible for First Nations portfolio in Vancouver 
Island, and I'm also in charge of Strata Properties. <coughs> Christian from White Sea Court, hey, uh, and he's in charge of our Inland Defense for Vancouver Island. So, how we value properties? Of course, our market value date is July 1st for residential and commercial properties. That, that being said, that means that we look to July 1st of each year for evaluation point for your assessments that came out in January. So what was the market value of your property at July 1st? Market value, um, for those who don't know, is the most probable price in which a property should bring in a competitive market under all conditions requisite to a fair sale. A knowledgeable buyer, a willing seller, open market, realtor involved, each party acting prudently, knowledgeably, and no one new um, stimulus. Price. That is fair market value, and that's what we strive for each year when setting our assessments. We also have legislative rates that are set by cabinet, and those are for properties like sawmills, farms, managed forests. We don't change those, we only administer what cabinet tells us to administer. Provincial. So, one of the important things to know about um, how we do our assessments is that we classify our properties into Different uh, different categories, and there's there's a couple reasons for this. One, it, it allows a variable tax rate system, so local government can set rates that are um, varying based on tax base size and the industry in which it is being taxed. So um, your um, your class one residential is pretty explanatory. It's pretty much all your single family dwellings. Um, that are used for residential purposes, um, duplexes, multifamily residences, apartments, nursing homes, manufactured homes, seasonal dwellings. It's, it makes up roughly 88% of our portfolio, essentially. Um, class two, land or improvements held for the purpose or uh, ancillary to the business of transportation, transmission, and distribution of um, telecommunication, electrical, cable, cells, or utility properties. Supportive housing, um, an example of that would be like the Victoria Cool Aid Society, Bank of Island Mental Health uh, Society. Major industry is <coughs> kind of is your port lands. The light industry is, is more your gathering pipelines for extracting and, and manufacturing, transportation of goods, um, that sort of thing. Uh, class six is, we like to call it, it's natural for everything else that is business related that doesn't fit into any property classes so um, everything from your your Woodgrove Center to your your downtown businesses they all fall into classics for the most part. Managed Forest is one of those legislative property types class 7. Uh, class 8 recreation not-for-profit would capture everything that's around golf skiing tennis ball games car racing trap shooting museums amusement parks those all fall into class 8. Class 9 is your Farm classification, so again, legislative rates. Yes, sorry. Okay, I have a question. Um, when we're looking at cannabis production, because some will put it under farmland, some are going to put it under light industry, some will put it under major industry, will that have an impact where we decide to put it, or are you going to look at that as, uh, you know? Well, currently, cannabis is like a controlled substance. Yeah, it's coming to light, yeah, yeah it changes. July, I actually have this. Uh, the same question from um, uh, Ministry in Victoria. Um, being a controlled substance, we, we're not, we cannot make a farm classification under the current legislation. I'm, I can't speak to or I'm not privy to like, how, that, how the, the legislation is going to change around that state. The, the, the seminar I attended with Bill Ballhauser of the Young Anderson, who's the lawyer that's talking about it all, he said okay. some will be put in under farmland because technically it is an agriculture crop, so it can go under so farmland. Changing yeah, but farm. like here in the Nile, we put it under like light industry or light, light, light industry. Is, yeah, yeah, light industry. Children, okay. yeah. 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 So will that have a difference on how they're taxed? Like I'm just wondering, like from a lobby group perspective. If it moves to to farm class nine, yeah, I, I I suspect a couple of things. One, cabinet's going to have to probably make an amendment to legislative rates to to recognize that particular crop. Mm -hmm. I assume because it's going to have a huge impact for governments if yeah. you know, everyone gets on board with growing cannabis. Um, one of the things we're seeing as a trend with farm properties, I'm not trying to digress from your conversation, is that with the rising market values on Vancouver Island, we're seeing a lot of 
the scrambling, trying to get farm classification. Yes. So they're actually doing everything within their power to put in an application and hopefully get farm classification. We're actually swamped with farm applications for new owners who buy properties. Buy chickens. Yeah, I've got four chickens and I want farm classification. Well, your chickens aren't going to yield you $2,500 a year. And that's Absolutely. difficult for a, a minimum of income amount for farm classification. We're, we're seeing it mostly in Victoria, where real estate values have gone through the roof. Um, we are seeing it more and more in the central and north island, where people, young people are getting into real estate and they can't afford it, so they're trying to afford the cost. And it's, it's put a lot of strain on the farm appraisals because we do give the due diligence and courtesy to look, review every application, but a lot of them don't need the test that we have to declassify. It's a lot of resources spent. Um, making sure that we have farm classification correct. So, around. is there a big difference though between... If I just might, sorry. Um, just from the onset, I should have asked if Mr. Primo was sure. questions at the end or throughout his presentation. I, and I had a speaker's list also with oh. um, Mr. With Jerry was on, this, on the list sorry as well. So, that. If, if we can just follow that protocol. Would you prefer questions continuing? I, the presentation is short, so I, I, I'm taking questions now. So, oh, you can finish your okay. yes, and I'll So, just my one point then, like, is light industry taxed at a different level than farm work, obviously? Right? Yes. So, that's what we're going to have to be really careful of when we start looking at if we were to change. Yeah, I don't have result. those stats with me. But no, yes. that answers my question. I'm good. Definitely, yeah. Definitely. Great. And then, uh, Jerry. Thank you. Um, with regards to the residential, what I want to see, I know that we don't have the ability to do, or nor you, yeah. but is it going to come where it's not fair that I'm taxing a person with a $300,000 house at the same rate as I'm taxing somebody with a million dollar plus house? Are, are you going to actually subdivide the residential rates now, or is that in the talks at all? Because it's just, it's just not fair for somebody that's paying, you know, Obviously, somebody with a million dollar, two million dollar house can pay a lot more. If we do that with taxes, I know that we can do that with each industry, but not within the residential. Exactly. So, <clears throat> the BC assessment uses what's called an ad valorem system. It's based on value, and that is demonstrated internationally as one of the fairest ways to distribute the tax burden is yeah. by value. So, we don't have any plans to go to a splitting out and say, you know, um, architecturally designed homes for manufactured homes. We, we give it a value based on July 1st, and you know, then we trust the local governments to apply the tax rate. This is coming up in a future slide. But uh, we don't have any plans to discriminate between that sort of, or that kind of split out. Um, it, what falls into the residential category, um, we take into, in, so just so you're aware, we, we take into account residential vacant land, single family dwellings, um, farm farm uh, improvements, um, like your house and some of the barns, um, stratas, and um, some development type lands. So um, we don't have any plans to split those out. Um, it's not really good on our radar. Um, we, we rely on the on the such value to be that fair as we taxes. And check can I follow up on some Thank you. And then just to follow up on derelict buildings, because I have put a motion together forward for a bylaw. Why do you assess, on our standpoint and everybody, all the neighbors' standpoint, you assess a derelict building at low value worth practically nothing, right? and it drags everybody down. Why aren't you taxing them more to force them to do something? For a prime example, a and Sound is sitting there empty for a decade. We have Amrico's down at Departure Bay for three years now. They're, they don't have no incentive to do anything because you've devalued them and they're just paying all the property. Why aren't you jacking the price up? Because that is one of the questions that I, I was going to ask staff, but again, that falls onto okay. your yeah, jurisdiction. So we, we base on value. So what is the highest and best use of that property that's sitting in the corner where a and Sound sits? It's probably got a higher value than a typical commercial building off, off the center floor. So we value it as highest and best use, which would be whatever the current zoning allows for on that particular property, less the cost for demolition of the So we go based on value, and if you speak to a residential home, um, you know, there's a demolition cost that could be involved with an old, say, a drug house or something like that. But there's there's still a foundation there. There's still um, 
the land value there is we do have to give it a fair market value for what's sitting on the terra firma as well. So you're saying the A and D sound is worth more. Are you basing it on future value or you think it's worth it's more than it value. It's current value. Based <clears throat> on the current zoning. Yes. So whatever the zoning allows for density or use of that particular property, which I don't have on So but there. that's the question, is you're basing that on the land itself, or you're taking an account, well, it's a crappy building, it's gonna cost you $5 million to demolish it because it's full of asbestos, rats, and whatever else you can think of. Okay. So because the build, you know, oh, best use is $5.5 million, but because it's gonna cost you $5 million to demolish a building, it's worth $500,000, is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. No. What I'm saying is, we're looking look at the total value of what that property would trade for in the marketplace. So we look at sales of commercial properties around downtown and I'm okay? And then we look at the square footage of the, the site for that particular building, we look at the zoning that's applicable to that building, we look at any restrictions in use, if there are any applied to it, and then um, we come up with a value for it. Yes, we recognize that there might be a demolition cost associated with it, and that's likely been taken into consideration on the improvement value side of things. But the land value is, is likely driving the value of that particular property. Okay, I'll get back to you and I'll show you the price of what it's assessed and you tell me if it's fair. Sure. Yeah, we can talk about that. Any other questions around property classification? Okay, so I just want to touch on um, um, an overview of the assessment cycle. Um, January 1st to 31st is, well, January 1st is our key date. We release our assessment notices to all the public in British Columbia. They're also available online at bcassessment.ca, where you can go on and you can look at anyone's property assessment in BC. From January 1st to the 31st, it's our inquiry period. So this is where we have, we allow the public to examine their, their assessments and contact us if there are any questions around their assessments, speak to an appraiser around how the value is arrived at, and then they have them until January 31st to file an appeal against their assessment. Um, February 1st to March 31st is the current time frame we're sitting in now. We are, all the appraisers in BC are now sitting in park appeal hearings and hearing these appeals from the general public. And um, panel, the property assessment review panel closes March 15th, and then we feverishly key all the information so we can provide it to local governments by the end of the month. So then you will have them have your revised assessment from the assessment reviews. April 1st to September 30th, 30th, sorry, we uh, we're busy doing uh, we assessment projects for all property for most property types in British Columbia. Um, this is when we go out in the field and we look at all the new constructions, so all the building permits that are sent to us by local government, we act on those, we go out to the field and we add them to the assessment roll. April 30th is the deadline to file the patent, and that's the Property Assessment Appeal Board. That's the formal level of appeal stage for a property, and um, that needs to be done by April 30th. And again, we get back to July 1st, which is our valuation date. Then we roll into roll production. So this is where we put our heads down, we analyze all the data throughout the year, and we start creating an assessment. So um, some key dates we, that we always keep in mind for setting the roll. October 31st, physical, physical condition and permitted use. So what was the use of that property as of October 31st? Was there zoning in place? Um, and what was the condition of that building as of that building? November 30th. Ownership reflects uh, LTSA land title records. So at ownership of the November 30th for the property. And December 31st, we um, release, we uh, close the assessment rule and release it to local governments and our park manager. And um, liability for taxation, that's the property owners, is as of December 31st. Thank you. Uh, Yes. So, just to follow up on the A&B sound question, I just pulled it up on your website. Okay. And you've assessed it at three hundred and eighty-two thousand dollars. How how is that fair? You got three hundred and sixty-two thousand dollars for the land, and you got twenty thousand dollars for the building. Okay. Because this is the problem that we see is is these building owners have no incentive. 
I understand that you've assessed the, the, the property across the street, the Gene Burns building that's demolished, just to strictly to land value, there's no building value. And I, and I get that. Okay. But why are you assessing that building at $20,000? It, it should be some ridiculous money before it's demo, so they pay tax on it. Why, why are you taking the demo amount out? That makes no sense to me because they have no initiative to do anything about it. So, in a real estate transaction, if you were to go buy a property, let's just say yourself, you're going to you and your wife are going to go look at a property, and you feel, well, you know, it doesn't really have, the, the, it's, it's crap house. The only value is in the land. What is the cost to you to demolish every of that property? Would you factor that into your real estate purchase price? But you're an assessment. You don't have to do, like if you're assessing these prices, my building is worth double of what you're assessing me at, at and the market value. Yeah. So I don't. It doesn't make sense on how you can add those other factors because, as a municipality, we, we try to be fair to all the residents and the commercial and our industrial. When you have a crappy <laughs> building that somebody's not interested in doing anything. It, it brings the entire value of the area down. It, it draws downtown. So my question for you is, what is the what is the bylaw? We we do we we're, we're doing a bylaw, and that's what we're and I ask in hopes that with the BC assessment change, because that's going to be one of the questions I'm going to ask our bylaw department is to push for you to say that derelict buildings should be taxed at a different rate. And I'm not saying that you you don't have a category, but you have land, you have building, and then you have demo. Something that you can add to it that shows it, but as a tax purpose, is we want to tax that land, right? Because we're not getting any value, and our residents and our merchants don't get any value. I see your argument. Yeah, um, it poses a big challenge because we need to push. We need to move this through cabinet and legislation, so that would have to be a provincial yeah. change. We can't orchestrate that locally. No, but I, and I hear that from a lot of other municipalities that have derelict buildings bylaws. Okay. We're, we're, we're not the only one. Right. So if this is something that we should bring up at ABICC or UBCM, maybe UBCM it is something that we should bring up. That. But I just wanted to ask you the questions about right. what if you were thinking about these steps, exactly like the residential, yeah. uh, the rates of it. But yeah. if it's not something that you guys are looking on the radar, if you don't are pursuing cabinet, you know, if you're saying that you're going to pursue cabinet for a change, and you need our help to help you do that, that's great. But if you're gonna put up resistance and we're telling you on this part to try to force it, it makes a different kind of conversation, so. No, we are, we are very open to working with, uh, <coughs> with, with the changes, um, you know, proposed changes to cabinet. The GFOA is a very good um, uh, arena to, to bring that up and bring that forward. Um, you know, what I can tell you at this particular point is that we value it as of July 1st. So what would the market pay for that property as of July 1st of the previous year? So that's our mandate under legislation. So that's that's why the value is sitting in that. What it is for the A&B sound building is because that's, that's the value as July 1st based on the market evidence we see for other trading commercial properties in the downtown area. So, I mean, you know, there's something you could consider going forward. One is your bylaw change. Um, two, you know, anybody can appeal anybody's property in British Columbia. So if you, if, if the city decided that we want, we have a very strong stance against its value, you could appeal it. You could do a third party appeal like this. Yeah, because you actually decreased the value from last year. Last year, or increased it by a little bit from 349000 to 362000 for the land. Building still 20000 So you're telling me that piece of land where all of Nanaimo has skyrocketed. We're having our, our citizens complain to us about how high it's gone up. This piece of property went up from $349,000 to $362,000. That just doesn't seem right to me. That I'm not arguing with anything. I'm just you know, looking at it, right? Yeah. As a city, we should be doing that under bylaws. But yeah. thank you. Good points. Yeah. <clears throat> Any further questions? Yes. So uh, when you have a we need to talk about residential property. Okay. If I've got a half acre residential property, it's considered to be for its purpose, which is residential uh, enhancements, if you will. Okay. So I can build a, you know, I can build my house on it. I can build a, you know, I can build a garden shed. I can build a whatever I want to build on there. Yeah. Patio and so on and so forth. That changes when I find myself with half of my property 
unable to build on because of repairing setbacks. What uh, consideration can be uh, is taken for properties that you cannot build residential enhancements on? Where, where we have riparian encumbrances on properties, we can adjust for that based on sales of similar type properties. So if you're say on a on a on a tidal area or riverfront, and um, you're finding that your property is being inundated with water erosion. Uh, that sort of thing. Typically what we find is their riparian setbacks registered on title and they're usually, um, they're usually 30 meters I believe at least from the waterline. So we do look at the use of that property. We've got to take a lot of things into consideration. One, is it at its highest and best use? Like if, uh, if the zoning allows for a single family dwelling, do we at least extract that use out of the land? So we look at that first and then we look at any other encumbrances like maybe the issue, you've got sloughing bank or something like that. And if we see it's an issue in an area, we'll, we'll look at maybe considering an adjustment on the land values of all affected properties. So as we're seeing with changes in our world weather patterns, we're seeing changes in our water frontage as well. Um, I think it's going to be very challenging for appraisers going forward to, to value waterfront properties. There was a really good study released by the Real Estate Institute about four years ago on riparian areas and waterfronts, and uh, let's just say it's a changing property type. And uh, where we're being aware of changes to the property like that, we will make corrections. Okay. okay. So the basic formula, we provide a tax rule on the nine prescribed property classes and provide the local government every year. The local government sets their tax rates and administers the taxes to the property owner. I think everyone's pretty much aware of that one. So now I'm going to speak to a very common misconception around um, changes in assessed values relative to property taxes. We get this question probably, it's the majority of our questions that have come through in inquiries, and uh, I know that an Iowa office will take upwards of 300, 400. Inquiries in January, especially when the notices come out, it's very busy and it's papers on towards the end of the month. We're probably seeing about 200 inquiries a day. And this is actually on our assessment notice, so this goes up to the public. So if if your if your property value is lower than the average change, like let's use the nine one percent, the typical change is around 15%. So if you're lower than that, if your change is lower than that, say 10%, your taxes are likely going to be less than than the average for everybody else. If you're similar, if you're coming at right at 15%, which is just perfect 15, I expect to pay the same taxes as everybody else. If you come in higher than the average change, you've done a major renovation, you've done an addition, you're probably going to be higher than that, or you've gotten to a property class, say, that has had a higher increase than the typical change, like we've seen um, more upscale homes that have been quite busy this last year, you might see a slight increase in your property taxes or the average. But this is a very common argument. My assessment's gone up 25%. I can't afford my taxes to go up 25%. That is a very common concern for the public. And we have to explain this model. And this is that kind of potential communication. Question over here. Yes. Pardon. Um, what is Last year, my uh, assessment went up 74%. My taxes went up almost 100 Why? <laughs> must must be an anomaly. So your, your assessment went up 74%. Yeah. Because there are uh, about five <laughs> years ago. Okay, so they finally caught up. They finally caught up with it. I don't have a problem with it. I'm just saying it's, uh, you know, it's kind of funny when you when you mention that uh, taxes and assessment. So you've gone up more than the average. Oh yeah. So then I would expect higher taxes. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I have no problem with that. I don't think we might see taxes in this town. No, me either. Thank you. <laughs> we don't get positive comments here. Well, when I, you know, when I take my dog around Westwood Lake, you know, when I know that I got police and fire in my neighborhood, you know, I can see a fire truck rolling by in my neighborhood, you know. Six minutes away, barely. Yeah, it's, uh, it's value for money. I enjoy living here. Okay. Thank you, Mr. I've got one, two, three, four oh. more slides. Sorry. I, okay. Oh, yeah. So now we get to City of the Nine. So we talked very high level about provincial 
uh, our provincial board. Now you're just going to yeah. go to the state. Yeah. So let's start with the progress. So I got some stats here. I want to make sure I get out here. So. Uh, the assessment rule increased from 2017 uh, in total properties to just over 2 million. Um, there was an increase, let's see if we got it here, oh, I don't have it here. The value of the provincial rule is up almost 12%, $1.86 trillion. The non-market change, which I'm going to kind of slide around this and I'll explain in a minute, is up 30% almost uh, for British Columbia, which is $31 billion in non-market. Non market, I'll go into in a minute here. So now, city of Nanaimo, um, the uh, number of folios, if you want to say, is up around 1%. Uh, 37,000 from 2017 rule was 37,300, and now we have uh, 37,700. So just about 400 new folios, and that goes from subdivisions, land amalgamations, all sorts of stuff, and change that number. The uh, increase from the 2017 rule, so basically your your uh, non-market, your market change, uh, your market change at uh, 2.6 uh, billion dollars in value for the city of Nanaimo, and new construction non-market is up about 3, 380 million. So a nice jump from last year. So now I want to talk about the non-market change. So non-market change is a change that happens in the assessment rule, not related to market. So this is. Just as it says, your new construction. So you add a new house to the wall, that's non-market change. That's not a 5% lift because the market pulls us. So that's adding a brand new subdivision of homes. That's taking, taking, that's demolishing anything that uh, needs to be restructured. Subdivisions, of, of course, takes vacant land and splits it in multiple parcels. That is a non-market change. That's, that's gravy, in essence, beyond market for the uh, local governments. Zoning changes, boundary extensions, property class changes. We might move something from one property class to another, or split classification, or exemption status changes. So these are all influencing the value of the assessment rule um, every year. So exemption status changes, there might be an exemption granted by council one year, that following year does not apply. Property class changes, as we mentioned, we might move something from class one to class nine in the farm. Boundary extensions, local like government may extend or shrink their boundary, that will have a more wrong impact on, on market. Zoning changes, if you change the density of the zoning, that will add value, because as I mentioned earlier, highest and best use based on zoning. So we get these zoning changes into our office, we act accordingly. So that pretty much covers it. So that is the non market. So when we were talking about provincially, on the previous slide there, 31.8 billion in non-market change. That's all the new construction. That's all the subdivision. That's all the zoning changes and bylaws that changed our province each year. That's what it added to the provincial role. It's almost 30 billion dollars, which is huge. Uh, I have a question from. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thanks your presentation. It's great, by the way. How? Uh, that bottoms the bottom um, bullet. Uh, exemption tax status changes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if this is. If you're privy to say or have an answer, but where would the will be on our permissive, our tax exemptions? Like, are we too high, too low? Are we the average city our size? Because I, I, I'm under my one, -on -one person believe we should have a cap and some policy because it, uh, otherwise it can run in the wild. I'm not saying they're not valid. There's no validity to it. But I think sooner or later we can really grow so much this city. Yeah, yeah. And I'd like to sort of think about a cap and see if you, if your knowledge, where would we be? That's not a fair question because it's not that. It's a pretty advice. challenging question. Yeah. Um, when we receive all the permits of exemptions from local governments in the fall, um, I can't remember the date, I think it's happened and completed by, I'm guessing, October. We trust that the cities or local governments have done their due diligence around the exemptions that they've passed that we apply on their behalf to the assessment. So now to speak to to speak to a cap on like so I said, give me an example on like, what you're just like say an exemption on say your legion or church. Well, you want to pick up a certain thing, but this okay. Let's just say <laughs> multiple faiths, which would be churches, I guess. Okay. 
how many do we need? I don't want to be Then how many, like what classifies us to go in there play any place of worship? Yeah. So under the community charter, there's some pretty definitive guidelines around yeah. that. You know, it's got to be a place of public worship. It has to be open to the public. It has to be, you know, used as that sort of space for a minimum of 150 days. Uh, if it meets that test, you know, they apply to you each year for, for okay, say, 10 years of the exemption. So we try to follow up where we can. They're very hard to track for us to follow exemptions like, okay, you just granted a 10-year exemption to a, to an entity. You know, if we see that it's got a change in use or it sells, yeah, we investigate because that, that exemption will run with the land or run with, yeah, with okay. the title sort of thing. So it's hard to track. We do put a lot of trust in our local governments that they've kind of do, done that due diligence as well. And if there's something around an exemption change that you would bring to our attention if you were made aware of it. As for a cap, I didn't see anything, and I oversaw a lot of the exemptions for Vancouver Island. I didn't see anything too anomalous with that's not okay. Um, in comparison to here, we had Victoria. We, we did, our office does from Victoria we to the north part of Vancouver Island, and the parks of Bowling, and Tofino, and everything in between. There wasn't anything anomalous around the exemptions that we saw. Like, if there's something that stands out, we come back to the local government and say, is this what we meant? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we kind of do that test as we're. So if something's super outside, you, you, you alert us. Yeah, because sometimes, and I'm not saying it's sitting in the but sometimes we'll get very vague descriptions of the property that they want. Like, we usually ask for a legal description or a parcel identifier number, and uh, sometimes we don't get provided that. We don't get the term of the exemption, like how long are you wanting. Like, we follow up with that. But when something doesn't make sense when it comes through to us, we'll follow up. Okay. Yeah, that's, thank you. Thank you. I have Victor uh, and then Jerry. No, just a, a quick comment on, on the question uh, on the table. So you have statutory exemptions and permissive uh, yes. exemptions. So the statutory ones, you really have no... Say, no, they're federal. Say, right. Yeah. The, the permissive ones, those, are, those become policy and political uh, at the end of the day. So uh, you can place caps, whatever caps you want, uh, but, but you have to run through that you constituency uh, and lobbying and all that stuff um, I've seen I've, I've seen places that have tried to, to make caps and I've seen the pushback uh, I'll give you uh, without naming a place one place tried to do that with uh, Girl Scouts or something like that uh, and they brought a chain of little girls in front of council and council just couldn't do anything so so you there's a policy side of it with the permissive ones, uh, and, and there's probably room to, to deal with that. You have asked us to look at that anyways. Uh, so we'll, we'll bring that back to you and, right. and, and show you where, where we are with other practices elsewhere. Great, thanks. Sure. Um, thank you. Yeah. So another one of these things that really bugged me, I don't know if you control it for it's maybe Dale's department. <laughs> it's okay, because I mention it every time. <laughs> Is subdivisions and zoning changes. So when, so let's give an example. Okay. Somebody buys a chunk of land, <coughs> repurposes it, and wants to put a five story, 20 unit, whatever development on it from yeah. a single family. And once we approve it, first thing they do is step a for sale sign on it. Prime example the student housing we just approved in Wake Asaya has a for sale sign on it. Uh. So that really annoys me when we tell the public that we're, we're gonna, hey, we're gonna put this development and we go through this public consultation and all this and then there's a for sale sign on it. And then what do they come after is they say, oh, well, you know, it doesn't make any sense because we got ripped off on how much we paid. So we need another five units to make it work. So then we have to go back to the public. So how do we, I know that this has always been a staff question. I said, well, how do we revert this back? If they don't build, can we revert it back? But in your perspective, can we, charge them already? Like, if they're going to say that they're going to build this, giving them a two-year exemption saying, hey, you've said that you're going to do this. If you don't build it, we're going to charge you based on what your subdivision development calls for. Because they have development permits. <clears throat> right. And I know nothing kicks in until they apply for a building permit and, and they build. And that's why a lot of builders kind of build in the time frame before September when you guys go out and do your assessment. October so October 1st, so they get a yeah. year ahead and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But how do we ensure that we're just not subdividing 
for people to flip and not actually to build anything because that's really one of my biggest things is we go through all this work, we put the, the community through all this stress and they put a for sale sign on it. I don't, I don't feel that we have any mechanism in place to work with that. Yeah, I think that's you know, a staff, you, I've always asked staff that question. You have the fee simple title, you know, it's your document under LTSA, do what you want with it. So, what, what, what I'm hearing is, in essence, you know, you're preparing the land, you're preparing everything, you're getting all the zoning changes, the bylaws changes, and boom, you've made a perfect product for somebody now to go to the market, the market's hot, and so, yeah. so how do we force that? I don't think we can. It's, it's, it's a challenge, I can see your frustration yeah. in that, absolutely. But it has to stay, it's a system of housing, right? that's what it's been. Well, for my part, I don't understand why we care. Um, I mean, what we care about is the use of the property, and we care about whether it should be zoned to single family or whether we should bump it up to something else. I don't really, who owns that property doesn't enter into it. Why should it? Why would it matter to us if Jerry Hong uh, got the zoning and sold it to Bill Yoakum, and Bill Yoakum built what he's permitted to build, which we already said. Well, that's permitted. Well, it's not who owns it, it's who's going to build it and how fast they build it. They come to us and we go to the public and we discuss it with the public, saying, hey, we're going to build this, and the public expects it to be built. They don't say, well, this is going to just be rezoned. Nobody comes to us and says, hey, I'm going to rezone this property so I can flip it. But so somebody else care? can build Jerry, tell me why we care. Because we've talked to the public and we've told the public that we're going to do this. And like I said, what happens is what? most of the time they come back and they do something different. But Jerry, what if it, they flip it and the next property owner builds what, what they're permitted to build? Oh, I would What's love to wrong? see that, but that hasn't been the case. No, so you think it's, it's the flipping that does it and not the, you think that that's wrong? That if, I, if I get the council to say you can build five stories on here and I sell it to somebody else and they build five stories, you, you that interim process there is the wrong thing. No, I expect, if that's the case, I expect you to build what they're going to build. They don't build it. That's the problem. They come back and they change the plans on us. But, but we have to approve those things. So I'm just going to yeah. We're in the I'm driver's just seat. Yeah. 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 I, I, I know. I get it. I know. It, yeah. it, it, it baffles me. We could have a strong debate about this in, in so much as rezoning and then we go to public hearings and we do all that yeah. stuff. And, and But if somebody does own it, they can sell it. Uh, Dale did have his, his hand up and he was wishing to just make a comment at leaving. I think you just in this context, maybe here talking about taxation today, I think this, this debate is on, and, you know, I'll try to bring applications forward to you and evaluate them based on policy and whether they fit into our long-term plans for development of the community, whether they have shorter term or longer term, it's not necessarily something we evaluate at that point in time, but what I would say, and what you heard this morning, was if we take a piece of property that today is zoned single family and tomorrow you zone it for multi multi-family or commercial mixed use, that, that land has higher value. It's yeah. reflected then in the taxation. So although you might not see development on it today or tomorrow, you are seeing an inflection in higher um, higher taxation. So if you look for example at your downtown core and broke it up per square meter charge, you would see that you're actually making way more revenue per square meter of land in the downtown oh, yeah. because of the zoning because of the, the density of the potential use than you are in many of the other areas. Yeah. What are you, what are you we appreciate zoning changes, so if, if there's zoning changes for the city tonight, which we do get on a regular basis, we apply those to the city. So we work now in the highest and best use, just like we mentioned, if it's gone to residential, to commercial, or higher density, more to family, we recognize that. We have a, we have, that's our obligation to the government, is to, to you provide us with information. I, I will just remind everybody too as well that we it is being filmed just so that everybody is cognizant of the fact that we are videoing these sessions now. Okay. Wrong stuff. Um, so for the city and I uh, assessment changes that happened on the 2018 assessment will pick the, some of my top three residential, strata, commercial. So out of the 75% 
70 and 80 percent of those particular folks. Those are the changes we've, we've seen residentially 10 to, 10 to 25, straggling residential. We took a big jump this year on Vancouver Island, 10 to 30 percent, uh, commercial around 5 to 15 percent. That represents the majority of the folios. Typical assessments, this is how they've changed over last year, from 2017 to 2018. The 9 one, like I mentioned earlier this morning, was roughly 15%. Strata condominiums have gone up a lot. Wow. And I feel that the, the reason behind that is, you know, your single family dwellings have, have witnessed the values going up, go up quite a bit over the last year or two. Let's look at the next best affordable market where we can get a fee simple property. Townhouses, they went up a little 11%. Let's just go a so of course, uh, we have a uh, newly branded website. Uh, you can go online, you can see interactive market trends, maps, and stats. You can put in any property in British Columbia and pull up the assessment on it. Um, we have all sorts of fact sheets around all the property classes, First Nations, you name it, how to appeal, the assessment process. Have, there's really added a lot of content to our website, so we really encourage people to go and have a look. And as I mentioned, assessments by address. You can look at um, anyone's assessment in British Columbia, and uh, as Jerry did there, you can look at the NBC so one, so that's available right away. It's an excellent tool. And that's all I have. So thank you very much for this presentation. That's great. Thank you so much. I'm very informative. Uh, no, thanks. Um, about three years ago, um, in Nanaimo, a single mobile home park spiked significantly in value, caused rise to the assessment authority watching mobile home parks across the province. Okay. Um, has, that, uh, has that changed much? Have you seen significant uh, increases in, in trading values of mobile home parks in the province? The actual park itself? Yes. Mm, well, I have seen a rise in that eventually, in the trading and manufacturing home parks to be redeveloped into other uses. Um, there's some thoughts behind it, you know, the, the income stream for the patent fees aren't worth, aren't worth the value of the park, let's redevelop into something else. Um, we're seeing this in, in areas where land values are spiking. We're seeing this in areas where, where development land is rare. Um, you mentioned manufactured home parks. One of the trends I'm seeing too is with First Nations in the southern Vancouver Island area. Sawi, Songhees, Beach Bay. I'm skipping my mind here right now. But in these areas, Central Sandwich, the city of Victoria, we're seeing a lack of development land. And we're seeing an interest in these First Nations lands because they're they're central to prime. Well, Beautiful ocean front on a lot of them. So they're getting into the development game. Where manufactured home parks are the same thing. They don't really command a higher income stream. Let's redevelop them. And unfortunately, it's a trend we're seeing in some parks. Not necessarily in Animal, I haven't seen that. Um, but more so as the values rise in the market, we're seeing a, a more focused scrutiny on land values and their use. Thank you. Go ahead. This is arising out of um, your comments about um, mobile home parks. And okay. I wanted to ask our staff. Um, this is this has come up as a, a topic of interest in the past because I'd say maybe twenty years ago or so there 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 was movement to sell um, mobile home parks for just single families. Um, and we, I think we took some steps at that time to try to stop the flood of that. Um, did we ever do that, or have we considered it? Because if we're now coming up to a situation where we might be losing that kind of housing, which is more affordable, then we're going to add to the housing problems that we have for lower income. I certainly recall the discussion. I, I my recollection is probably about 15 years ago, the province actually changed the Mobile Home Tenancy Act. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but it used to be if you have a mobile home park and you were going to close it down to sell it for other use, there was a compensation to 
to the tenants of, I think it was equivalent to like a years. I think there's still that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's okay. still there, but the province amended about 10 or 15 years ago and they reduced the actual amount. I don't have the exact numbers, but I think it was like a year to six months or something like that. I can look into it back to you. I think the discussions we had at the city at that time, if I recall, so the majority of our parks were actually only zoned as and therefore we had sort of the ultimate control of where Okay. So something that might very well be yeah, up in our, in our something that we strategy. should get our radar on before. Yeah. I think this just happened in the Capital Regional District in the last year. Is that right? Yeah. Sorry. Any other any other questions for Mr. Pini? Thank you very much. I just have um, the presentation, the PowerPoint. Yes. Is that possible for us to have the PowerPoint yeah. uh, presentation as Absolutely. part of your yeah, presentation? Yes. Can we have yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all yours. Yeah, thank you. So we can shoot that out. Please. And thank you very much. Well, thank you. Appreciate you coming. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Alrighty, moving on. Uh, the next um, item on the agenda is. Uh, Mr. Art Root is going to provide us with a Thank you. presentation on the Harewood covered space that it is in completion. Morning. Morning. Uh, so this is a, a follow-up presentation from the December 13th committee meeting where we presented the request from the primary user group, the Nanoa Cross. And I just wanted to say thanks to a couple of members from the Nanoa Cross who are here today, Sean Swanson and Bruce Clark. I just wanted to say thanks for coming. We've worked lots of them in the last couple of months just to get to this point as well. Um, so the committee meeting just started a quick refresher on December 13th. The committee approved the uh, budget increase of up to $220,000 for the proposed surface change with the request that we would come back with uh, what it is really you were approving in regard to uh, potential cost and then some alternate choices uh, should, there, should that be uh, chosen. So just a quick picture there of the lacrosse, here's the cover court. Um, after that meeting on December 13th, what we did was we already had a specialty surface engineering firm kind of on standby. And once the committee said, yes, go forward and get us that information, we had them give them the green light to proceed. And so what they did was they let us know that the proposed surface would be similar to what a skateboard or a skate park surface would be. So what that gave us was the ability to go out on site along with some members of the cross and the city and the staff and do a comparison on uh, what the concrete surfacing was like uh, compared to the initially agreed upon uh, asphalt surface. So uh, we went up to May Bennett uh, in the north end of Nanaimo and it was uh, helpful there in regard to there's a tennis court there and there's the skate ball so we could, uh, we could look at those two surfaces, compare the grittiness and the slipperiness and it was actually quite good too because when we went out there it just like it had rained the night before and there was some debris on the court and so it was a really good opportunity for uh, lacrosse and Sweden and Nanaimo staff to just have a good comparison. And then, um, uh, had a quick went out to Cedar Skate Park just because it's a little bit newer than the May Bennett one and just had a look at that surface and again it had just rained that day so we had a look at that and um, it was quite, it was still quite a grippy surface as well. One of our primary concerns with a, a concrete surface initially when we went through the whole process was that the concrete surface was going to be too slippery and so what we discovered with going out to, to the sites was the, the proposed finish and these finishes they don't they don't pose that for us. It's not a it's not a slippery issue. So it's not going to be like a polished arena floor, just due to the fact that it's a totally different concrete mix, and it's also a different proposed finish than an arena floor. So we we could kind of eliminate those two concerns off the bat. So then we move forward with we got a uh, January fifteenth. We got a draft from the engineering firm. We looked at their draft. We did a uh, conference call with them. Uh, our initial concerns were. Um, if you see here in the dotted lines, those are what are called control joints. There was way more of those in their in their initial draft. So right off the bat, uh, even just as a staff that uh, don't play the sport, um, we weren't happy with how many control joints there were. They were proposing a certain type of control joint that was really quite um, labor intensive from a maintenance perspective. So. We talked to them about changing that. They proposed another product, which again we reviewed with the Lamo Lacrosse, and we agreed that that would be a fine product to use because it posed no uh, long term maintenance issues, nor did it pose any kind of uh, safety issue for the sport. So, and then uh, 
This ends up being the uh, draft two with the, um, uh, the engineering firm. And so we use this and send that out to our general contractor to get some pricing and some options that way. So what we have then is we have obviously the green playing surface, which was initially uh, an asphalt surface. And so with the concrete options, uh, there's two options. One of the options, the lower one, just had to do with some other ideas around the perimeter. But you can see that the um, estimated uh, additional cost to the project uh, for switching over to a uh, heavily reinforced and concrete, uh, polished concrete surface is about at its highest about $162,000, which the committee has approved up to $220,000, so that falls within our budget range. Uh, while we were going through the pricing exercise, we just also asked them to have a look at the apron areas and the perimeter and just in the canopy areas, and we had them separate that out and just add some additional pricing. Um, moving forward, it's so you can see that uh, if we just were to add concrete, green finished concrete into the red area between the two courts, it uh, takes the price up to about $204,000. And then if we concreted the entire covered area, including the breezeway in between, we're sitting at like the $220,000. Um, it was more an exercise in pricing just to provide enough information should, any, should a question come up regarding cost to turn that into concrete. So the recommendation really is to, uh, as per the request by the uh, Nanaimo Lacrosse with the primary user group, is to do the switch over uh, in the playing surface and then maintain the, the rest of the apron in asphalt. Um, just a question on that. Sure. Does it make more sense to do it all concrete? The one thing that we've consistently talked about in regard to this location is what about five years from now, but about 10 years from now, right? So like a future development or addition or doing that. And with asphalt, it's only two inches. It's a, it's, a, it's a much easier product to kind of get out of the way if you need to get back into the ground and do some utility stuff. Concrete, again, much thicker and heavier to deal with, more expensive to deal with. So if there's a potential that we're going to do some stuff in five years and 10 years and 15 years, it just gives us some more options and less expensive. So everybody's happy with the asphalt where you guys go? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Sorry. the aprons really, it's, Thanks. it's a clean place to, to, to stand. Or, okay. You know, but, Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, so I mean, that was really what we wanted to do, was just bring that forward to the community to say, this is where we're at in regard to the design, the engineer design. So we're at about $162,000 ad. And um, barring any unforeseen weather events, um, we're still hoping, right, for that you go up early able to be able to open that for, for the process. Thank you. No. Thank you for your presentation and uh, <laughs> the update. So, so this is all committee's budget, which is great. Yes. Of course, put yourself and uh, Sean and Lacrosse. And uh, so, he uh, answered the question also, this is not heat up for the season because it's around the corner. So, that's what we tell, tell her because we might hear and keep working on this. Based on today's decision, it's yeah. a phone call as I walk up the door. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Mosha. Um, Thank you, Art. So, Art, are you concluding your presentation? I uh have, -huh. yeah. yeah. So, sure. is there any other, any other questions? So my, my question simply is, uh, it's 162 to 220. Yes. And there's no um, there's no ask here for any recommendation. This is just a presentation update. It's an update in regard to the, the December 13th. Yeah. So if I may, then if we wish to do anywhere from 162 to 220, yeah. is basically what you're putting in front of us. Yeah, you exactly. want to do it all this two yeah, So the green there means just doing the surfacing as for the engineer design, and then we do have some options there if we wanted to go concrete, but in in, a, in discussions kind of from a future development perspective, the recommendation, not that it, but a form of recommendation there, option three, um, <laughs> is to just keep the exterior as per the original contract so there's no additional cost there. We can just focus it on that point kind of the yeah. line surface. So, thank you. So, the reason I'm asking the question is because we did previously identify up to 220. 220. And so, for 220, we 
to get the ranch, the purple, and the green, get all finished. Or we can just do the surface to the preference of the major user group. So, so my question is then, if there's 220 allocated, Correct. where would the 60 go if we only do the green? Where does the $60,000 be reinvested? Does it go back in some? Where, where does that money go if we don't spend it now? So I can answer that. So we don't spend it at the end of the year, at the end of the project's over, it goes back into and back into reserves. Um, so unless council wants to do some other things, we, we may come back with some extras, we may come back to the options for that, but this would get the project to completion. As of the projects, we have a surplus that goes back in at the end of the year. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, absolutely, I don't want to stall the project at all today, so I look forward to getting a move for the plane service. $60,000 um, being up there, I don't know if it's part of the plans, I'll start to look at here. It's um, a change rooms and whatnot. Like, is that, is that part of the plan, or is, that, is there, or is that not being looked at yet? Change rooms are there, so we're using the old change rooms. And we're is there quite a horrible? We've been doing some work on the inside, so probably been inside for a while, Council Yoko. So we're the opportunity to do more. The, the frame of that, of the old structure, is really good. Yep. Still, and so we've, we've updated the washrooms already, and then we're, we've got some plans of doing some improvements to the internal of the, of the change rooms. We also want to see how much the user groups are using it and see if we want to put the divider back down the middle of the change rooms and things like that. So the, the bones are there to do the to, to do some more upgrades. So, so I think the point I want to make is if the sixty thousand dollars already earmarked for this project, I'd like to see the sixty thousand dollars remain intact, somehow connected to this, and if we can enhance change groups or something in that area, that's a good chunk of change to work with. But that's my, that's my view. But nevertheless, I don't want to stall the bigger project. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Just wanted to concur with Councillor Yoka, but that sixty thousand dollars is there and available to enhance the uh, showers or whatever. I think we should do that. Thanks. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I'd just rather just go with option 3D, the 60000 I like being, well, we're already over budget, but I like to be under budget than our projected over budget. So if we have extra money, let's discuss that when that comes. But let's just do what staff are recommending with option 3 and go with the concrete. And if they find something in the future that we need after the project is done and the users groups that see that, hey, you know, we should have done this and we didn't foresee it, at least we had a little bit of money left over. We needed it. So, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to defer to Mr. Mema. Uh, we don't have a recommendation. Are you looking for the council to provide a motion here to take to council, or are you just no. assuming that it's going to be option three? I, I'm just curious. I'm just. If I could ask, you know, as we as I just referring the, the, the past uh, motion. So we were to come back to you before we proceeded to ensure that you wanted, council wanted us to proceed with a certain option. So all we need is a, is a concurrence that to tell staff to proceed with concrete for the plane service. If we could have a motion for that, that we're, um, we're fine, we can move forward. I'll move on to three. Second. So it's moved by uh, Councilor Collins, seconded by Councilor Brennan. Now, any discussion on, on the motion? Before I call the question, so I, I just do have a quick. So we have allocated two hundred and twenty thousand dollars to this project, and to the surfacing change. Okay. To the surfacing change. So, and the surfacing change, to me, so it's not incomplete. So we're getting what we want under cover, and the exterior, the purple and the, and the red portions that connect the two surfaces, to me. I think should be done at the same time. Unless there's a higher priority for the $60,000 that's remaining of the 220 that we allocated to the project. And if there isn't, then I would prefer to do option six. Because I don't know that, there is, that there's a higher priority for that additional $60,000 that we've already agreed to apply to this project. Uh, so, if, if I'm being told that there's a higher priority for the $60,000 that we've already allocated to this project, then I'm okay with deferring, but otherwise I 
I won't. I want. This, I, yeah, it's going to be the surplus, but I won't support the motion if there's two hundred twenty thousand dollars there to be spent today that would make the project more complete. Uh, so that's just my comments. So now I have Cheryl. Sorry, just, just for I, clarification, I sorry. If I, this may be clarifying. Just Art and I were worried about having these other two options on the bottom because it would conf confuse yeah. things. So I um, probably thought we'd put it in there just to make sure. But it, the, the aprons around the building will be done under the existing budget. Or maybe oh, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so if you could confirm, just explain that, Art. Yeah, so, so the, the aprons were always going to be asphalt. And then in the initial tender contract that went out, the playing surf, both exterior and interior playing surfaces were going to be asphalt. And then the request came for the, the proposed change. So the aprons on the outside, none of that changes. That still is 100% completed. It's all asphalt. It looks very good. Yeah. That's your question. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. okay. Now, that's yeah, the yeah. So, yeah, you're right. If it's completed, that means sitting over there. Thank you. Um, there's a motion on the floor. All in favor? Carried. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Eric. Sorry, I was going to No, no, no. It was my fault for putting that. No, no, no. Mr. Chairman, what we will do when the project gets closer and there's some options to, that we think some things could have uh, got a surplus, we can share those with council at that time for other things on site that we could use. Yes. Using up that up to 20 that we can have. Great. Thank you very much. Nice timing for PA. The next item is on page two, and it is uh, 6A to be introduced by Mr. Mema, uh, and it is to inform the Finance and Audit Committee of changes to the city's internal policy for water rate adjustment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is really this is a misnomer because that's how we've done business in the Uh Staff don't do policy, we do procedures, but that's, that's a long-term pro project we work on. But we have an internal process uh, where we adjust water leaks, and we had fielded a number of uh, questions, and we've just made a change just to respond to, to the leaks and how we would uh, deal with them going forward. Thank you. Thank you. There's a recommendation on page 15, moved by Councilor Brennan, seconded by Mayor McKay, and it reads that the report titled Amendments to the City's Water Leak Adjustment and Turtle Policy dated February 14, 2018, be received for information. Any questions? All in favor? Carried. Thank you. 6B is the quarterly direct award single and sole source purchases in excess of $250,000 and instances of non compliance purchases to uh, be introduced by Mr. Mill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is in uh, compliance with the purchasing policy, where at the end of each quarter we provide you with a report. The recommendation in front of you is that uh, you receive uh, this for information. Thank you. Thank you. So the recommendation is on page 21. Uh, do I have a mover and a second? Move. Moved by Councillor Arthur, second by Councillor Fuller. Any discussion? Uh, I, I do have a couple of questions. I see Richard has left, unfortunately. I just wanted to be curious about the sole source purchase um, for the fleet. With the Zamboni 526 conversion at $35,000, and then a Zamboni purchase from Crocker at 111. And uh, so my question was simply going to be if there was other um, Zambonis that were eligible for conversions. And I'm making the assumption that the the $111,000 Zamboni is propane powered and not electrical while we're moving toward electrical at the neck and now we're converting one Zamboni to electrical. Why we would invest $115,000 plus or minus on a gas or propane powered Zamboni. Sorry, I don't have the answer. So we don't have the answer, but we can quickly follow up with that in an email. With an okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do I see any? No. Um, to be honest, uh, if we were to buy a new propane and convert it to, uh, or even gas and convert it to electric, it's cheaper than buying an uh, electric from the manufacturer. Yeah, my only point is, is that if we have existing fleet Zambonis, because we do, that we're converting now to electric, because we are, for $35,000, why would we go out and get a fuel-oriented sample that will last us 10 years before we'll 
consider converting. So there are ten points in our fleet that are eligible to be converted. I haven't gone through this the last time. If it were me, I'd buy a gas one and convert it to electric out in Coombs. Because you'll save a you, ton of money. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just suggesting that as opposed to buying a new gas one, we could convert because we're converting now. So I assume that our plan is to continue to convert, or we do have existing ones in our fleet that we can convert beyond the one that we're converting. No, but, as, yeah, but as, as I was saying, if we wanted to buy a new Zamboni and we want to go electric, I would buy a gas one and convert it because we'll do it for a hell of a lot less money than going to the manufacturers and buying an electric. Buy a new one. Yeah. yeah. We have a motion on the floor. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Um, 6C, Downtown Event and Vitalization Funding Program 2018. Grant recommendations to be introduced by Mr. Lindsay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just turn that over uh, to Mr. Anderson for a brief Thank you. So uh, annually we, we issue a call for our downtown event um, program. And this year we received uh, a total of 34 applications and we're recommending 30 of those for funding within the uh, envelope provided by the council, which is a total of 150,000. Uh, just for information, the total amount of the task that we saw this year was in order of 284,000. And we saw an increase of uh, 23 applications last year to 34, so just to give you that context. But we're here basically with a recommendation that those applications uh, in the report for your consideration. Thank you. The recommendation is on page 25. Uh, do I have a mover and a seconder for discussion? Moved by Jerry. Seconded by Diane. Yep. Any discussion? I have Diane and Jerry. Just interested in knowing what we have is. Sorry? On this, uh, the event applications and 950 and the defense be happy. I don't know where, what is it? I don't have to don't worry. I guess it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a kind of sound It's obviously interesting. very small event, so, yeah. uh, and so it doesn't take much to have. Don't worry, it was rejected. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Okay. All right. Jerry. Um, thank you. I, mean, I, I support these organizations in, in this funding, but again, some of the questions I had, I, I wish we could phase this because we have a lot of stuff happening from this calendar in July and August and in, in, in the summer months, but what the downtown needs to see is events in the January to April and the October to December. So I know that we, we're going to have this discussion for the next go around, but promoting events <coughs> on the downtown times, should, it should be really important to us in, in, in helping with the downtown. So I would like to see some of that because this is all geared towards, I get everybody wants to do it in the summer, but funding for us should be helping merchants on the times that they need help with. And the other recommendation I would like to see on, on, on these reports is, we hear the, we see the event applications. I like to know who's doing the events because it doesn't tell us who's doing it. It could be eight organizations doing all 30 of these events, as far as I know, and I, I wouldn't know that, and where they're doing the events. Because that's always a good thing to know when we let the public know, especially when we launch this and release this to the public, they they know where it's going to be happening. So it, it, it just seems like it's missing information that we could provide to the public. And, and I think that would be very helpful, especially for the merchants of downtown to prepare for this. You know, and other than waiting for it, be happy. Well, exactly what Council Brandon says, well, it's happening in April. Where is it happening? You know, if I'm going to plan an event or something, I don't want that to happen in that time frame. So, more information on, on this attachment would be great. Thank you. Good points. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks. Uh, Bruce. Yeah. Uh, about half of these are outside of the peak season, summer season. Yeah. Just so you know. So. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bill, you'll come. Thank you. Just quickly. Yeah. Good work, guys. And uh, I look forward to the Commercial Street Night Market. And I don't know when it comes back to us to support Mr. Potential street closures, closure and stuff. So that's great. It's a great street. You can do it so can we. Thanks. Any other comments, questions? My only comment is that uh, when we previously discussed this, we talked about the criteria and the paperwork that 
comes at the conclusion of the events to ensure that we do that follow up. So I'm making the assumption that that will be duly noted, that the post event criteria will be completed in order to make application for the next uh, day. That's an eligibility requirement. So the, the repeats from last year submitted their final reports. Can we get those? Yes. Yeah. I think it, that'd be good to see. I, I like to let the public know what we got, what they got for their hundred thirty thousand dollars last year. Okay. And I guess return on investment. It's good, good information for the public. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor. All in favor? Carry it. Thank you. Uh, The Heritage Facade Grant 375 Franklin Street on page 3 is to be introduced by Mr. Lindsay to obtain council approval for a Heritage Facade Grant for the Harris Residence 375 Franklin. Thank you Mr. Chairman. This is a facade grant for just under $9,600 as you mentioned for 375 Franklin Street. The property did receive um, a facade grant in 2010 $3,000. But they are eligible for uh, this work, which is estimated just over 19,000 under the existing policy of 5050 caution. So, uh, staff's recommendation is, is for the grant. Um, I would note in the body of the report, it, it says that when you get to council, and we're actually asking for a vote at that time. Because this is assistance to business, it actually requires a two thirds vote of the council at that time. It does not require when you're sitting as a committee meeting. Uh, Mr. Schulberg is in the audience. If you have any specific questions about the project, I'm sure he's happy. Thank you. The report is on page 33 to 40, and the recommendation is on page 33. Um, are you moving? Nice. Moved by Diane. Second. Seconded by Cheryl. Uh, questions? Oh, Jerry. Um, thank you. Question to Mr. Schulberg is that there's a $20,000 budget available. That, that's total for this year, right? That's correct. Yeah. So. We're giving away ten half that money within the first two months. Are we expecting anything to come up the rest of the year that we're going to have money to help those people that want grant funding, or do you think this is the only one we're going to get this year? We usually get one to two applications per year, so my suspicion is that they have another application. I have to come up to the horizon at this point. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a motion on the floor. All those favor? Thank you. Um, what is that? Franklin, just Yeah. Item E, 2018 pedestrian improvement funding, uh, and the purpose is to seek council direction on allocation of pedestrian transportation improvements to be introduced by Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll uh, pass the introduction over to Mr. Rosner. So as part of the 2018 budget, $300,000 is allocated to priority pedestrian upgrades. Uh, it's an unallocated fund, so the intention today is to put for the council and the committee to uh, have council allocate those funds to a specific project. Uh, because it's a new fund, uh, one of the challenges is the timeline it takes to uh, develop, design, and uh, get a project ready for construction. So the most straightforward approach for this year will be to accelerate a project from 2019 uh, into 2018. Uh, so the, the, next, the next project that's uh, suitable for that would be the, the Dufferin Crescent sidewalk. And uh, it's been in design for several months now, so it's well along its way to be ready for construction. So we believe we can uh, construct that in 2018. And so the report and the recommendation in front of you today is to allocate the, that $300,000 to the Dufferin Crescent sidewalk. And we uh, have Jimmy Rose here that can add more detail if uh, desired and answer some questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Rosen. Um, council's pleasure. Uh, perhaps we can get the recommendation on the floor and then discussion. So moved by Diane, seconded by Cheryl. Any discussion? Go. Oh. Um, Jerry. This is for. Uh, development services staff, how is it possible that a development like this gets built with a requirement for works and services from that, from the developer that are not completed and yet we give occupants and permits? So th this project was completed, 
I would guess in the 80s, and it was before our current works and services bylaw. So it was at, just shortly after this time that our works and services bylaw got adopted. It now requires projects such as this to complete road works to the center line of the street, which could be curb gutter sidewalks, street lighting, uh, repaving. So if that project was built today, it would build the sidewalks. Would there have been a requirement for sidewalks at that time? There was not. So follow up, I could. We've got another one up in another part of town that we're getting mail about, uh, correspondence from the neighborhood about, where a roadway was proposed that appears to be different than the roadway that was built. Uh, this is the one where it's narrower, and we've now gone in there, Bylaws has now gone in there, put no parking signs up both sides of the street. How does that happen? You said it's in the north and there's a house. Um, there's a it's sort of a cul de sac y thing. Yeah. Yeah. I can follow up before you give me. I'm aware of a situation you had um, some calls about councils getting contacted on in the south end about the, where we had half a road that was constructed between two properties, uh, which is a normal approach. Um, we have two property owners and we try to look at the ultimate layout of the subdivision to have the road being built up between the two property lines. When there's a half road built, because we don't have the ultimate pavement width, we'll often eliminate parking until such time that the road's constructed. That was the case at that point. But if there's another one you're getting contacted in the north end, if you want to give me the location, I can follow. This, this, is, built, this is a separate and distinct from this one? Yeah. Okay. So, so we, I guess, to back to my original question, we should not find ourselves in this situation again that we are now having to build a sidewalk because a developer failed to. And the only the only time that we do not get sidewalks today is if there's some technical reason why they can't be built. So for an example always comes up, do you want a piece of sidewalk in the middle of nowhere and not connecting right. anything? So we often we look, we will look at that. Um, and also council has the ability to waive uh, sidewalks. Yes. So you've done that on some projects. You did that down on the uh, seniors facility uh, off of 10th Street, I guess. But in the middle of the no mall, but in the middle of nowhere, uh, sidewalks. Yeah. Where you've got 60 foot, 60 feet of sidewalk, curb gutter of sidewalk, and the, the rest of the street doesn't. In that case, there would they still contribute to the fund? No. There's no ability to take. We have looked at that in the past. There's no ability to take cash in lieu of completing the works and services. Thank you. We have a motion moved by or Charlotte, do you wish to I just want to say I think this should be done. Uh, I'm there every day. You see there's so many pedestrians down there. I think this is very important. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so is this all of the budget? Like the question the reason I ask is you said that we're gonna spend three hundred thousand dollars and the bill's gonna come in at two hundred and ninety-five thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine dollars. So is all of three hundred thousand dollars the pedestrian transportation improvement budget? That's the whole amount. We're moving over to this one project. Is this project going to be more than three hundred thousand? Less than three hundred thousand? Are we going to be short? Do we have some more money? Uh, excuse me. The the most recent uh, estimate is just under three hundred thousand. So that has a, a fifteen percent contingency. Event, so thank you, thank you, Diane. So I'm interested in how uh, this works. Uh, so we have a five-year plan and we lay out what our staff recommended us as, as the sort of best chronology of events. And then um, council has this other fund where we can um, supersede staff recommendations for the next five years of where we'll do work. So I'm wondering where where do we get the criteria that council will apply to this specifically say to say yes that it makes sense because of this information. Like what am I how am I evaluating this? I, I'm not sure. So so I think the, the, the intention with the fund was to be able to accelerate pedestrian priority projects that would otherwise have to wait for, for, for years down the road for their funding to be available. 
so I mean there is there is funding um, that we do use for pedestrian facilities, but quite often it's tied up in these concurrent projects. So when we're doing like say we're replacing a sewer on a street, you know, if that street really warrants a sidewalk, we'll take a look at that and potentially we'll allocate funds to that because it's it's occurring at the same time, we're only disturbing a neighborhood once. There's a lot of reasons why we try and bundle these things together, we tend to get a lot better value. But one of the things that, that misses out is 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 pedestrian projects that are really just a priority on their own. And that's that was the intention of this fund, was to help move those a little bit further forward along. Um, so I think our plan would be to come in front of council sort of in January, February of every year and make a recommendation as to how to allocate those funds out. Okay, so ultimately we'll be using staff's opinion to make these decisions. We'll be relying, I guess, on your opinions. It won't be that because I'm really afraid that this could be open to some sort of um, political interference or political gift giving or something like that. Those things are known to happen, right? No? They are. Yeah? Yeah. I mean, can we get this trying to keep the, the conversation? Is, if okay, we well, he, keep, he, he, If we can just try to keep the conversation on Yeah, I'm just suggesting to staff that without some sort of clear framework for me to apply to this request, then how do I make the decision? Is, is it staff's recommendation, or is this a request from council? Mr. Chair, it could, it, in my opinion, could be either one, and it, it's open to discussion as Mr. Rosen said each year we can bring ideas in front of council but of course it's council's prerogative and how that, that money gets spent. So if council has a particular project that they, they're feeling public pressure from then that's council's prerogative. But this one, did it arise from staff or from council? This would arise from, from staff in 2014. So typically the, what, what staff do is we'll, we'll identify the next highest priority pedestrian facilities project and we'll put it in the fifth year of the capital plan. So as we move forward, it kind of advances. So that lets us catch it in the design two years in advance and sort of get it ready for the construction year. So this one's been in the plan for, the for a long okay. time. That's... I have Cheryl and then I have Jerry. I appreciate what you say, Dan. However, I think it's important that when we're getting like, you know, like maybe 100 or 200 people telling us that that's a priority for us, we should be able to bring it to the table. And then, uh, but hold on. Yeah, but um, if I could respond to that. I'll, I'll just go around this. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll allow you to, but we'll just go around the it's side. It's just my point, you know, like, yeah, it's, no, I, you I know, understand. We, we hear from people all the time, and I think we should be able to bring it to the table, and then you can make your decision based on did it come from staff or where did it fit. Plus, what we're hearing from the community, and I know I'm hearing lots because I'm down in that area a lot. So, and I just know that it's uh, it goes with our transportation plan staff identified in 2014. So, for me, it's a, it's a priority. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, Jerry, then Gord, and then Diane. Um, thank you. I'll reluctantly support this just because I would have liked to have known what 2018 pedestrian transportation improvement items were for 2018 because I get that we hear issues about this one, but we're also hearing issues about boxwood. So would this money have been able to go towards that project per se? Yeah, so we've boxwood was re reviewed about the, uh, the same time in 2014, and it was reviewed again this spring. And what we're finding there is actually it's, it's the dynamics of all of the modes of transportation working together there. We're hearing concerns about access management, we're hearing concerns about visibility, visibility of the access, it's the, um, the way drivers travel through the area. And, but what we're also seeing is that pedestrians are not going up and down the corridor, they're going across the corridor. Yeah. So a sidewalk is not necessarily going to be the cure uh, all there. So we do have a, a lifeline schedule for Boxwood in 2019, and we believe that that is going to start defining, defining space along the corridor and starting to address some of those concerns. So, good, thank you. Diane? So, <clears throat> that's really good information. So, just in response to, yes, we get lots of um, calls about particular places. Um, but that's what I wanted to know, is how do I make, how do I as a counselor 
um, determined that Dufferin, Dufferin is first in the queue. And so that's what I wanted to know, is who is making this decision? Because it is, it is um, open to political interference if we don't have a method of evaluating why we would move forward on this project instead of another. And I rely on staff to have <coughs> those kinds of analyses, that, and that helps me then make a decision. That's what my point of this is. So, Mr. Chair, um, sorry, but uh, Mr. Amendment, and then Mr. Sims, and then So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good conversations. I think the, the intent, uh, as Mr. Rosen said, uh, politics will always be there. Uh, but our commitment as staff is that we we'll always give you our best advice, whatever that that is. And to Mr. Sims' point, then you decide which way you want to go. Uh, Councillor Hong did raise a good question. I think we'll take that into account when we bring the next the next one, where we'll basically give you context that says here are the other you know projects in the five year plan, and we're recommending this because of of X Y Z. And this year being probably the first year, transition year for this fund, uh, we, I, I would venture to say we're learning as we go, and, and, and I think we'll get it right the next time. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Simpson, and then uh, Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just briefly, we got a presentation in the chamber ready to, to provide to the committee that was intended to address this issue as far as how we evaluate projects on industrial facilities. So that's, that'll be coming. Thank you, Gordon. Yeah, the, the whole political interference and concerns me. Um, and I'm, I'm just curious because I recall a number of years ago, Councillor Brennan uh, pushing for a sidewalk thing in the Dufferin area with the Hospital Area Neighborhood Association. I'm just I'm curious as to whether this is the same one she had mentioned a number of years ago. Because uh, I know other groups want to see <laughs> sidewalks in their area. The South End has wanted one up off of uh, Halliburton for quite a while, and so on and so forth. And I do understand that there is a process. So I'm all for the process. I'll support this one because it's definitely needed. I drive that area all the time. Thanks. Thank you. Um, any other comments or questions? Uh, I just wanted to comment that um, we have moved monies from a project onto Northville now, given the uh, intersection improvements that are going to be made that was designed. So we've added, we've added to that project, which is a good thing, which we didn't really have a lot to do about, to say about. It was just advice and recommendations. As long as I've been here, I've never sat here and discussed it the uh, priority list, if you will, for sidewalks. So we're, okay guys, where do you want to do a sidewalk next year? We're, and we've got $500,000 to spend. Where, where do you want to spend it? So I, me personally, I've never sat in one of those conversations, but I think it would be interesting to have the prioritization of such uh, if we knew what they were. Um, and I'm sure you do. Uh, in when my portfolio was public works and engineering with Mr. Goodall, he indicated to me that the project that we're discussing right now was going to be done uh, in 2017 and then it was pushed out and pushed out or whatever happened and that's fine given the amount of uh, inquiries that have and the growth in that area from Bowling Road to the hospital and the amount of traffic that is on that road pedestrian and otherwise uh, it's an easy justification for me, given its density and the Boxwood connector and the mall that's, or if you will, the shopping center that's there. So it's a very easy one for me to support. Uh, I'm sure there's others that are every bit as worthy. In, in this case, this has been on the books for several, several years. And I'm happy that we're going to be able to help that area uh, with this recommendation. Any other uh, no. Just quickly, I just wanted to be cautious. Like, I'm really involved in, if I push or make comments, not push or make comments because it's common sense, but I witness. 
is it because of, uh, and this one here as well, I'm going to go see Auntie Ellen's insane, but I want to say, how dare say that, because I might be political interfering that I witnessed uh, horrible sidewalks there. So when I hear political interference, it's, 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 it's just misleading, that's why I reacted that way. And we've had two, we have two entities now tell us, switching gears, I don't get called point of word, but it's a state. We use the NRA, for example. We've had two government, two departments, city and RDN, say the business model is not a good model, it's not working, but you know what, it's still on the table. You know, our staff and RDN basically say it's not a good model, it's not a good business case. But you know what? It's still alive because it's all political, it's all politics at this point. So that's my point. Thank you. Thank you. And I would be remiss to I apologize. Uh, the boxwood sidewalk that has been discussed for probably four, five, six years that runs up to the new um, Northfield co-op gas on the corner. So that's we've just, we've had conversations about that stretch being improved. Um, in front of the uh, rehabilitation center and so many pedestrians and walkers and so on and uh, driver academies shortcutting through there and so on and so forth. So I'm sure that what's the prior priorities of sidewalks is put in front of us to make decisions on. I, I certainly look forward to that opportunity. Uh, call the question. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Go ahead. Um, we had an opportunity to provide some funding to this project without going into this fund when we had Dover in front of us. Dover was going to, when we were doing the cycle path that go with Dover, Dover was going to get cycle path and sidewalk across the street. This place here didn't have sidewalks on either side of the street back then, and it doesn't have now. I'm concerned that we should have taken money from there from that Dover project and put it towards this. Even the $90,000 that we got, or $96,000 we got from that, from the provincial government for the cycle path that we added to that project, uh, that could have been uh, that could have been eight new lit crosswalks. You know, $15,000 a piece is what I'm being told lit crosswalks were, lit morning crosswalks. Uh, that could have been eight. This, this could be 20. So I, I'm just I'm just saying that we had an opportunity to provide funding for this project and we chose not to. Thank you. Call the question all in favor. Carried. Thank you. Next item is the climate change resiliency section. Strategy. Uh, to be introduced by Mr. Lindsay um, with an accompanying information about a grant in the amount of $175,000 from the Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is really, at least from the staff's perspective, a good news story. Uh, you had $50,000 previously in your in your budget uh, to allow us to do this work, but through this grant we're actually we're going to be able to uh, substantially increase the scope of this project. So the $175,000 coming from uh, FCM will give us an overall budget of 225 uh, with additional there's additional money there allocated for staff support. Um, so we're recommending, recommending that the uh, budget be amended to include the larger scope for this budget. Thank you. The report is on page 44 to 46 with the recommendation. Uh, moved by Jerry, second by Cheryl. Any discussion? Call the question. All in favor? Jerry, thank you. Uh, then we move into this other business, um, a delegation, please, from Ms. Carolyn Montfrey, owner of the Carolyn Effect regarding the Kids Conference. Thank you for your patience. And <laughs> um, my name is Caroline Montfrey. I'm the new Caroline, which is I'm a new corporate events manager. I've been in Nanaimo almost two years. I'm originally from London, Ontario, and then I lived in Calgary for 15 years. And I worked at Virgin Private Corporation, Great West Life, London Life, uh, RBC Women's um, And always part of my job was event plan, so I decided to sit here. Um, when I went to the Business Expo in October, a lot of people approached me to plan. Conference because uh, Denise had left the uh, 
contact and the end of the meeting. So I took this on and I'm really pleased to say that the community of the panel has really stepped up. Uh, most of the event is being done for free. Uh, the content center uh, in your uh, in the proposal I've sent you this uh, of all the volunteers. Uh, there are some expenses, uh, some of the labor, uh, some of the entertainers, uh, to a cost of about $8,000. Uh, I have had some sponsorship has shown me, but most of the sponsorship has been on the But the uh, advertising is much. There is a cost, even though it's at this point. So I'm just here to I guess to see if um, it would be possible to have the city council continue to support this event. Um, I think it, at the, what I was told in previous years was 6500 dollars So I'd like to just ask uh, if the city would be willing to continue to support this wonderful event. Any questions? Thank you very much. Um, I will just open this to the table now. So. Uh, Diane, did you have a question? Yes. Um, I'm, I wasn't sure what you said. Did you say the city had in past years given $6,500? Yes, that's what I was told by the conference center. Okay, and um, is the conference center giving in? Yes, the, the, the venue is free. Uh, all the setup is free. The EV, the only thing I'm paying for is uh, the, the link. And then I will have a zoom through the link because mm -hmm. the target audience is lower income families. Yeah. So I will have, um, that's one of the costs. Uh, they are supplementing it. Um, they're, they're put $400 or something. Um, but the rest of it will have to be paid But um, I am, I have 40 kids. Three of them are still to be filled, but then they're close. Uh, and I just got um, confirmation yesterday that I got the printing for free because I thought it was going so that was a good news. And I'm still waiting to hear on some of these sponsorships that are about to. Any other questions? Uh, I have, but go ahead. Um, I'm just wondering if, if there's, um, if staff could tell us if this would properly be um, advanced through an, an application for some. So the sponsorship that we're talking about, the, the, the 6500 that supposedly the city uh, put on the table before, uh, wasn't done through the city, it was done through the conference center. Uh, and actually if it was running conference center on behalf of the city and they had these arrangements and that kind of stuff. So it's a good initiative because on, on the VICC side, it's kind of like one of those good citizenship projects. Uh, so, on our side, when she approached me, uh, basically quietly saying, I don't have this in my budget, I've never had it in my budget, uh, but it doesn't stop, I think, you speaking to, to counsel through the finance and audit to see if they, they can assist. The change that has happened with uh, uh, VICC is, while they still have some discretion to do the good citizen, you know, things. We've, we've kind of asked them to to probably speak to the city, uh, which is why they sent it this way. So I, I don't have this in the budget uh, as of now. Uh, we, we have various fundings and we have actually allocated most of them uh, through various, but it's an event downtown. It's something that I think you should consider. Uh, if you give the instructions to print the money, I don't have the machine, but I can look for the, uh, for the money uh, to try and assist if that's the, the, the will of council. But it, it, this, these are one of those conferences where just for the goodwill and the of, of, of the city. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, Two questions. The question I would have is on the interactive learning program. 
workshop component of case number. Is there any part, are any of those impact of learning from any like First Nations component, like Trump, yes. AK, or anything? Um, I don't know, know the details. No, no. Are any of those rooms in that aspect? Unfortunately, uh, they did have that in the past, and um, the uh, Aboriginal Center was not available this year, but we do have a team to and there will be some activities, First Nation, and we will have a, a, a First Nation prayer. But unfortunately, I was not able to secure that this year. Because yeah. if there was more interactive learning around workshops, I would want to do that personally. But I would need more of an educational component than the TV. No, and, and I'm, I'm still working on the details. There will be, like, okay. within the TV, there'll be educators. Like, oh, say this Yeah, it's the mid, mid, um, mid TV nation. We're getting up to some colder, but not warmer. Okay. okay. If there's something we can do local, yeah. with local Sanabo or, or music groups, I'm personally willing to be the sponsor of that room. If it's local for Sanabo. Okay, well, this is yeah. No, and I did try to. to like, I'm, I'm yeah. you're new, and this is how it's used to connect them. Yeah. yeah. But the second, my second point I wanted to make then is these really sponsorships and the shortage of money everywhere. And, and, and unfortunately, I'm very involved in the First Nations world, and we just did nothing with your court, but for our council, is that component with all those contracts up to 250 grand that just people get. Some people have to step up, that are, that are getting the city dollars to start giving back to the city. I know people do in various shapes and forms, but this is a perfect example where we can't make it part of our bylaws saying you got to do this or that, but just those side conversations. So you know, this great kids conference with um, kids, most kids are in need in some way, shape, or form. You've given back. But anyways, unravel, we can catch up later. Yeah. I just wish we people would step up. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jerry, I think you yeah. have been built. Thank you. And I think this is one of the points I've made before with our downtown event funding. We should hold some back because things like this come up. Had you had known, you could have applied for the $150,000 we had. And a lot of people in certain senses can't find a year ahead, yet we give the money a year ahead. And that's why I would love for us to break it from the first six months and then do in the next six months so people actually have time to prepare and do two intakes instead of one a year. If we allocate $150,000 per year and we say we're gonna do $75,000 you know, for the first or second half from January to this one and then in September we can do it for January to, I think it, there's a better way of doing this for event planners because a lot of them, if you're, unless you're planning a, a yearly annual event, nobody knows what you're gonna do in this was one of them that I knew was coming up. They did it last year, it was, it was great, it was a great event. And, and there's a couple of more that aren't gonna get funding that, we're, that we don't have any money for, so it's one of those things I wish we could try to figure out how to hold some of that money back to, to do this. Uh, and I guess, well, they also got things, so you can take note of something that we can do for next year's funding, uh, 150,000. and. Like to, to make this work, I don't know where Victor would find the money, but the youth advisory has three thousand dollars in budget. I don't know what they're planning with it, but if they wanted to get involved with it. They could. So, Jerry, I think your points are well taken. And if you wanted to make a motion relative to the direct staff to uh, consider alternate funding mechanisms for 2019, yeah, would probably be in order. And uh, Victor, um, you had your hand up, so I don't know if you want to. Uh, uh, because you put my attention about funding sources, but one funding source you have is your uh, council. Oh, stop it. Thank you, I should. So, well, I, I don't anticipate that we're going to make a decision right in this moment, yeah. but perhaps somebody would like to make a motion to direct staff to consider alternate funding opportunities as this event is moving forward on March 10th. Yeah. So we, somebody may wish to make that motion at this table, that. otherwise we'll just go away with the delegation. The motion. So, it, so, so I did have my hand up, Mr. Chair. Fair enough, then you're more than welcome to speak to the motion and make any comment that you wish. And it hasn't been voted, the motion hasn't been voted on yet. 
the point of putting my hand up was to put a motion on the floor. Well, uh, my apologies, I didn't have my crystal ball out. My motion was to provide the kids conference a one-time grant of $6,500 and that count and that staff be directed to take the funds from council contingency fund. Thank you. So, so if there is already a motion on the floor, I see it. That's fine. It's, we're, we're working. If we can just with if the mover and seconder would like to withdraw their motion. Thank sure. you. Just so the mayor, the mayor has made a motion. Uh, do I have a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Fuller. Any discussion? All the question. Carry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Did he? Just find out what I'm uh, now, Jerry, I think that this is where we get to 7 B. Yes. Great. Seven B. Thank you. Um, I don't know much information. I know that staff budget is for the LED project from Bowen Road. I like to relocate or allocate that funding that we're going to focus on Bowen Road this year to the issues that we have for LED lighting in September for downtown. What was the budget that we were budgeting this year for, for that project? <laughs> Thousand this year, and that was for the road corridor so along Spoling from uh, Terminal to 198 and Hammond Bay and Holes between 19 and so I like to change that going the the opposite way from Comox Bowen Road. Two hundred so two hundred thousand dollars in the downtown. I don't know how much that would get us. So uh, just had a quick look. It's about seventy. So just before. We go too far down the yeah. conversation just to let you know what it is. We did through our review looked at the decorative fixtures and they are cost prohibitive to replace for LEDs. So the yeah. new fixtures that went in the past year and a half are all LEDs. Mm -hmm. We did upgrade some of the standard street lights with LEDs at that time. That leaves us at about 65 or 70 remaining fixtures. So we could shift from uplands, halls, yeah. to complete the downtown. That's, that's the direction I would like to give to staff. That's a motion. Um, I have like Cheryl. Motion. I have Cheryl that had her hand up. And then if you wish to make a motion after Cheryl's done. I actually would like to keep it at the north end because I think we're, we're investing so much in the south end and the downtown and the north end that you're on the time that you're not getting any investments. So that's just my point. Thank you. Any No, after you make sure. Uh, so if if um, anybody at the table would like to make a motion as it relates, um, please put your motion on the table. So I'll make that motion that we move LED lighting project from Uplands and Alds Road. Alds Hammond Bay. Alds Hammond Bay to the downtown port. Is there a second or second oh. by Councilor Fuller? Discussion. Oh, yeah. So there's been a death or two at Old Road. Five. In this year, or in the one just past 2017, I think there's been at least one death in that year. On highway. Oh, sorry, on Old Road Highway. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. I, I guess I would think that. I thought that was Hannah Bay Road. It's Mary Ellen Drive and the highway. Mary Ellen Drive and the highway was one of the deaths. So it's a, okay. the, the, the reason for selecting Bowen and Terminal, or sorry, Bowen and uh, Hammond Bay Halls was they are, are more heavily traveled corridors. Right. When we get trying to deal with us, uh, bank or park with. Uh, so that's a sort of safety. And the one downtown, I guess, is. Is that safety? Uh, yeah, I mean, could I ask Jerry if the intention was yeah. to improve the safety downtown? Yeah, and that is I mean, the one reason it's like more, if we could have the more money to do the downtown core. I think we we're hearing from um, Pauline here and in some of those areas, especially along the park, if we can improve the lighting. So this isn't limited strictly just to replace the ball. And I think I want to focus on where there's issues that we need more lighting. Um, so we're not, I'm not saying spend a lot of money on infrastructure to replace 200 brand new poles. Like the museum, 
where we are pulling hair and having some of those lights in that area, I think it is the key. And I understand the decorative ones are restrictive and you have to rip them all out and replace them. So I'm not saying that we need to do those, but yeah. So the intention of the LED conversion program wasn't to add new street lights or to enhance the street light plant. It was it's more of an economic driver around energy efficiency and, and so on. So we're swapping out fixtures on existing dabbits. And, and, and so on, but I think what you might be talking about is a, like a streetlight enhancement program, which is this, they're different, they're different programs. So, so if that's what the interest of council is to enhance streetlight, it's something that staff have been talking about. Yeah. We, we, we lack a fund, uh, access to a fund and direction to go and enhance streetlighting within the city. So that's, that's something we're talking about bringing forward in future capital programs yeah. is to have a program like that, but it is different than the LED conversion program. Yeah. And I, I like to see this, the downtown core focus first. And I know that we've allocated some of that fund. With the issues that we're having downtown, I like to move that project, at least use that money right now for for this, for the downtown area. And enhance lighting instead of the replacement. Thank you. Um, if, I'm, if there's nobody else. This reminds me of a conversation that we just had about sidewalks and prioritization and who makes the decisions um, about where and what sidewalk gets done and when and where and what lighting improvements get done where and when and it's not something that we really have been engaged in about where lights go or don't go um, or sidewalks get done or don't get done unless it's done at the time of the development or otherwise. Uh, so I, I find myself in the exact same situation talking about lights right now, the sidewalks, and it's, what is the plan then for 2019? Uh, is there a 2019 lighting improvement consideration just like there is for 2018 up at all? Is there such a thing going on in 2019? So the, the vision for this program was a conversion. So once we do the, the uh, implementation for 2018 for Bowen and, and Alt and Hammond Bay, they're going to go back and review the results of that and, and get some feedback from the community. Um, there, like Mr. Rowe said, there's no, there has not been a conversation about expanding our network. It's a direct conversion one for one. Um, so uh, the, the plan for 2019 would be developed for the conversion, would be developed through feedback from uh, the results of 2019. So just from my perspective, I think the 2018 plan is in the works and to make any adjustments in March now would probably be uh, exasperate into 2019 and we wouldn't, might not get anything done until, until 2019 if we don't do this now. Uh, so I won't be able to support the motion that's on the phone. Any other conversation? Mayor McKay. Um, I can't support you know, an apples and orange sort of, sort of notion here. That, and, I, and I don't disagree that we need to take a look at lighting as a set option for downtown. And I think we should take a book, on, a page out of the book of Langford, where they created a bylaw that says you cannot have a business in their downtown on Gold Street without having a lit sign. What they were trying to do was to increase the, uh, increase the lighting in fact, their mayor said to me, he said, I'd like to turn the street lights off. I'd like to have so many lights down there from the, from the merchants that we forced to put lighting in so we could turn our street lights off. And they created, within a year, a full implementation of that, of that bylaw. The uh, uh, street presence and people on the street after dark went up by 300% because they felt safer. <coughs> so uh, I think maybe we should turn that off, that aspect over to the what's, public safety group, would it be? Public safety group? To, to yeah, to not, well, to look at um, septet options for downtown and put it on a high priority. And certainly support that. Thank you. Um, I think that the, um, a lot of the lighting downtown was financed through the BIA down there. None of it. 
to that. My recollection is that there was some complaint that they, yeah, they had took it. too um, they had too much in reserve for the lighting. No, they gave they it saving. Um, they anyway, that the was my recollection. They were supposed to, <clears throat> and they didn't, and they bought the Victoria Crescent Theater. Yeah. Camelot Tang, so that's what they Victoria They didn't buy it for Camelot Tang. That's where the, the city bought Yeah. Thank you. Um, so instead of um, talking about either this or that, and we have to choose between these things, I would really much prefer to see us expand our budget, add to it. If, if these um, things are important to us, and we you know, say that people are uh, asking us to do these things, then we need to, I think, re-examine um, the, the total of our, our budget and, and add to it. I think maybe we have been um, just too too skinny on our budget to be able to um, to do the kind of work that we are being asked to do, the work that we want to do. I'm not going to support this because it is a need. We're presenting it as an either or when I think we could finance both if we so chose. There is a motion on the floor. Any other discussion about the question? All in favor? Oh, and no, um, no, no, no. Would you like to redo this? Yes, please. Call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Motion is defeated. Thank you.